to Canyons Church. My name is Rayla. A few things before we get started this morning. I just want to invite you to our Canyons Cookout this Sunday, July 25th from 6 to 8 o'clock at Pioneer Park. We are going to bring food, s'mores, drinks, and all the yard games. You show up with your friends, family, bring a chair. We hope to see you there. That's July 25th from 6 to 8 at Pioneer Park. Also, we are starting a new series today called Your New Default. It is a great series, two-part series that Andrew Powell is bringing to us, and you don't want to miss this one. It is so good. Our mission here at Canyons Church is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's something we are very passionate about. No matter what step of faith you are in your life here at Canyons Church, that is our goal. So glad for you to be joining with us today uh, for this kickoff week of a two-part series, Your New Default. And this is this is a conversation I believe is going to be beneficial and, and helpful uh, for anyone because we all have relationships, whether they're work relationships, friendships, neighbors, family, kids, marriages. I mean, we all have a, a number of different types of relationships in our life. And if we actually take the principles that we're going to be talking about and we apply them into these different arenas, different environments, different areas that we have these relationships, I promise you, I promise you the quality of relationships that you have will improve. In addition, if your relationships in your life are improving, your life is improving as well. It's getting better. And that's what our hope is for you. So please stick around, please pay attention, and then apply it. Do the actual work, right? It's not, it's not enough just to listen you actually have to take the steps and do the things. So we're going to start off and talk about the gap this morning or today, whenever you're watching. There's a gap in our relationships. Every single relationship that we have, um, there's gaps in it. And, and let me explain. There's an expectation uh, of what is going to happen in our future. There's a future choice, a future decision, a future expected outcome, a future uh, expected behavior from the other person that we're in relationship with. And then over time, that future becomes our present and it becomes our reality. And often there's a gap in between the expectation and the reality. So you assume that something's gonna end up one way and then you're left with it being different, right? For your expectations are, are not met. Now this can put a lot of stress and it could put a lot of strain on a relationship. It doesn't matter which relationship there is. Any any time that there's a gap in, in the expectation and reality, um, there's going to be some added tension in that relationship. Now, let me give you an illustration, uh, just kind of a, honestly, this is the sketchiest thing I think I've ever been a part of. <laughs> That's what this is. I was in Bible college, which is a great way to start that. Uh, I was in Bible college probably the the summer before my senior year, so I'm almost done um, I needed a job. I was kind of in between a couple jobs. I just needed a part-time job uh, just to pay some bills and, and to really save up for the next semester coming up. Um, so I, I heard from my roommate um, that uh, one of the guys that lived in my apartment that he actually had gotten this new job, super easy. It was telemarketing. 
Um, so he said that the essentially the company had already been given information. People volunteered their information they, and they signed up that they wanted to learn more about this product that we were selling. Um, so we had their information from them. Not uh, It wasn't a cold call. And, and then we actually would follow up, answer their questions, and we went through a script. And hopefully at the end of it, there was a commission attached if they if they signed up um, all the way. So it seemed pretty easy from the outset. Now, let me explain kind of what the company was selling. They were selling online uh, subscription to a newsletter that would give them vacation deals and uh, savings. So whether it's a destination, and it changed every single month, um, a destination or an airline flight or a hotel or whatever it might be, you, you would get these discounts along the way f just for their customers. Now, the big, the, the big motivating factor here for people to sign up wasn't necessarily the newsletter. That just was like, uh, no one was really calling about that. It was more because we promised to send vouchers, airline vouchers, two of them, for every new subscription. So they were worth up to, I think, $600, something like that, which is why, I mean, everybody was like, well, yeah, I'll sign up for a newsletter, pay $35 or whatever it was, and then cancel it after a little while, and I'll get the airline vouchers. We're good to go save some money and get a trip paid for. Well, um, I just, to be honest with you, I didn't feel great about it the whole time, but my friend was already doing it. Um, so I kind of trusted him and, and I just thought, well, it's gotta, it is what it is. I'll just, I need to get in, get my money, like make my money and then get out. So I, I did it and in about a month, I wasn't good at it and I didn't like it, but I survived. So in about a month, I was able to actually save up enough for the next semester. I hit my mark. And I said, peace, see you later. Probably not, but I'm out of here. And I left. And I went about my, I went about my life. Went back to you know, Bible college. Uh, I ended up getting another job at a security, a security position at a hospital. And so, I mean, life went on. Well, months go by, and later I hear from, my, from the guy that lived in my apartment, my roommate. Um, and he tells me, he's like, so... You know how we, we didn't really feel good about that place? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, I found out some stuff. He essentially had researched. He had kind of, he'd pulled back up old customers that he'd had sign up. And he called them to check in on them. And then found out that they weren't getting their airline vouchers. It was a scam. The whole thing was a scam. And I... So let's just let's get this out there into the world. Um, if you about 20 or so years ago signed up online for some airline vouchers uh, that went in a, as an agreement or an attachment to this newsletter uh, for vacation deals and you never got a voucher and you bought them from a poor Bible college student. First of all, I am so sorry uh, that I apologize. I wish I could do something about that. Secondly, I mean, thanks for helping pay my tuition to, to college that semester. I don't know. It's bad. But this is, I mean, this is what happens. In a relationship, even if it's as silly as a phone call, you have a relationship with somebody that you're talking to. There's an expected future outcome that you can both agree on. And then when that expe expectation is not met, there's a gap between that and your reality. And that gap can be so difficult for the relationship. It, it almost seems like the expectation sets the bar for our happiness, or at least a level of our happiness in life. Because if our expectations in relationships, if it is met, the expectation is met, that's like the lowest level of satisfaction and happiness. As long as the bar is set and we make it over the bar, it's like, I mean, I guess it was okay. It's what I expected to have happen. It doesn't make me the happiest man in the world, but you know, at least, at least it happened the way I thought it would. If you exceed expectations, that's where you start to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. That's great. It's even better than they promised. Like that's, that's where your happiness starts to increase, right, often. But if you don't meet the expectation, you're below that line, there's tension, there's frustration, there's anger. There's all kinds of things negative that take over that relationship because of the gap that is found in those moments. The amazing gift that we've all been given in life, God created the world and then he created us and he created us a little bit different. He, he gave us the ability to choose. We choose all kinds of things. 
we choose the friendships, the relationships that we have. We know we've talked about this before, that your friends determine the direction and quality of your life. So we choose actually the direction and quality of our life by the people that we spend time with. We choose to go to work for a sketchy outfit uh, that we don't really trust, but we feel like we need to or whatever just to make ends meet for a little while. We, we choose to actually give a stranger our financial information and allow them to charge our card. We choose all kinds of things in life. And sometimes those choices work out and sometimes they don't. But ultimately, as we choose over time, we are creating a default. We are creating the direction of our life. Let's call our, the direction of our life our default. It's, it's who we are. It's the direction that we're moving in life. Now, I don't believe that we are the sum total of everything, you know, of our choices. I, I've seen it too many times, whether in, you know, history, in scripture, or just in my life, that there's something that actually adjusts the sum total of our decisions. It's God's grace. But when, when grace and mercy are introduced into the equation, we no longer are, are bound to the sum total of our decisions, that our identity can be found somewhere else in something else, that we can move in a new direction because of God's grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, his love that he has for us. But essentially what we're looking at is that over time, our choices become our default. Now, we can change our default. We can choose a different direction. We can choose to allow God to move us to a new default. But essentially what we're talking about is that on a, you know, day in and day out, the choices that you make, the decisions that you make, move you in a direction. We're going to call that our default. Now, this is a, a massive, massive idea because the decisions that we make allow other people to trust us or not trust us. And the decisions that other people make also allow us to trust them or not. Trust is so critical and important, especially when it comes to our choices. There's a, there's a quote that I think is fantastic. It's so powerful, especially in terms of teams, especially in terms of groups of people working together. Uh, so if, you are, if you're working in a group at school or if you're working in a, a team of people at work, or a family unit, whatever it might be, this is, this is huge. Listen to this, what this author, uh, Reggie McNeil, says. Teams use trust as currency. If it is in short supply, then the team is, is poor. If trust abounds, the members of the team have purchase power with each other to access each other's gifts, talents, energy, creativity, and love. This is interesting. That, that the more we trust somebody else, the more we allow them access to our potential, to our strengths, to our abilities, to, to the opportunities that we provide for the group to grow, to get better, to improve, to move forward. But it all comes back to trust. That's the currency. That is the foundation that all of this is built on. If, and if there's no trust, then the team is poor. And if the team's poor, then they don't have access to each other's, the, the aspects of, of life, the qualities that God has placed in them from the get-go, from creating them all along. Now, there are, there are two things that we can place in that gap. When there's a gap in, in our relationships, the expectation and the reality, right? The expectation's not met, uh, it, the reality hits, and all of a sudden there's this gap in the relationship. We decide one of our choices that we make in life and in these relationships is what to place in that gap. When that happens, before, you know, everything, before everything is defined and before it becomes our past, in that moment, we decide what to place in that gap in the present moment, before we have all the answers, before we have all the information. And there's only two things you can put in it. You can put trust in the gap or you can put suspicion in the gap. It's one of those two things. Either you're going to trust the person you're going to believe the best, or you're going to be suspect. You're going to be suspicious about what they said before. And the thing that we know is that trust builds, suspicion erodes. Trust builds, suspicion erodes. But, but the reality is we've seen it too many times, right? That we can't just trust everybody all the time because that in itself is actually harmful. It's dangerous. 
to actually just trust blindly everybody all the time. That's not healthy. That's not helpful. And the reason why we're not trusting, right, the reason why it's so difficult uh, to put trust in that gap is twofold. There, there's two reasons why it's difficult to put trust in the gap. First of all, it's who I am. It's my context, my history, my experience, my previous relationships that I've been in, the, 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 you know, the family that I was born into, the work history that I have, the other places that I've worked at, the other you know, dating relationships that I had before this one, or whatever it might be. My story, my history, actually, who I am, makes it difficult for me to trust other people. Isn't this true for you? It's difficult to place trust in those moments because of who I am. It has nothing to do with the other person. It's more about me. I don't trust you because of my experiences before. The, the other reason that makes it difficult to trust is what I see. It's not just who I am, but it's also because I have a stat sheet in front of me. It's like, this is the content. This is the context. This is the content. I have information at my hand, at my disposal, that makes me leery about this, that makes me suspicious about this gap in this moment. So it's two, it's two reasons. It's one of those, you know, these are the reasons why it's difficult to trust, and you're either going to put trust or suspicion in the gap of a relationship. Now today, as we kind of dive deeper into this discussion, I, I wanted to bring up an illustration. It's, a, it, it's, it's in the Old Testament, and this is what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, one particular moment. And if you've gone to church your whole life or, or you've read the Bible quite a bit, you may be pretty familiar with this story. Uh, if, if not, maybe you've heard of this story before, but you may not have heard all the details surrounding or maybe you've never read it before, you've just heard about it, or maybe you haven't heard it at all before. And this is new information for you. This is the story of Moses and the burning bush. So Moses, uh, this whole story is found in Exodus. It's the second book of the Bible, the Old Testament. At this time, kind of the, the background to where we're going to be looking at, um, the Israelites, so there's, there's this group of people that started from a family of 12 sons, and those 12 sons moved into the Egypt area, like the re Egyptian region within that nation. They weren't Egyptian, but they moved in. And over time, they became a very uh, populated group of people a populated nation that didn't have a nation of their own, essentially. So they're called Israelites, um, the 12 tribes of Israel. And they're living in Egypt. But as their numbers grew, the Egyptians became fearful of them, right? Because the, there's this nation that's within their borders that could do something, you know, adverse to them. They could try to take over, they could try to overthrow, you know, whatever it might be. So being afraid of them, they decided the only way to take care of this uh, is actually to put them under their control. So they made them their slaves. And they continued to grow in number. Um, and so, uh, again, the Israelites grow and grow and grow. They're uh, in slavery for like 400 years. And, and at this point, they've kind of forgotten who they are. I mean, they're just existing under Egyptian rule, right? They're not doing anything. They're not going anywhere. Uh, nothing is happening other than they're just slaves. That's their existence. That's their existence as a nation. Now, just as we pick up the story, again, the numbers are so great that Pharaoh in Egypt, the, the Pharaoh that people in Egypt believe that he actually was a deity, he was kind of in charge of everything, and he was the, the most powerful person on the planet at the time. Pharaoh decides uh, the way that he's going to, to slow down the increase in numbers is actually to remove a generation. So he orders that all of the all of the sons, all of the new baby boys born of these Israelite women would be put to death. And and that's what we're that's the background to where we're picking up right now because Moses is born to a an Israelite uh, man and woman and they want to protect their newborn son as you do as a parent. So that's where we're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 2, verse 3. But when she, this is Moses' mother, when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him 
and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Now this is, this is an incredible story. <laughs> it's an amazing story. It's, it is wild to say the least. But this is also what we're going to look at. This is Moses' context. This is who he is that leads him in this moment that we're going to look at in just a little bit. This is what makes him decide or act or respond the way that he does. It's part of his context and who he is as a person. That this is what he was born into. So she puts him in this basket along, uh, along the reeds of the Nile River. His sister, who we know his sister is about seven or so years older than him, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, Moses' sister, seven years old, asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? So this little girl is, is kind of there to see how it all plays out. And just happens to be Pharaoh's daughter is right there at that moment. And this little girl's like, uh, he's crying. He probably won't, he's probably hungry. Do you want me to go get someone to feed him? Doesn't say it's his mom. And so Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother, which is amazing. And then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, the mother, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. So this is, I mean, this is, this is a plan and a half that just happens to work out perfectly, right? In order to try to save their son. They realize that the only way to do this is actually have their son protected by the Egyptians. And it just happens to be that Pharaoh's daughter is the one that grabs on and holds on to this, this baby to protect him. Uh, and then the mom gets to feed him, you know, gets a little bit more time with him before she gives him back. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So she knew she was going to have to give him up, but this was the way that she was going to save her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Now this is, like I said, this is an incredible, incredible background to who Moses is. That Moses actually, he grows up with this as his history. Because Moses, he grows up, right? He becomes an adult man, still living in the palace, still you know, with the Egyptians, but he's not an Egyptian. But when he goes out of the palace, you know, the Israelites around him see him, they're slaves, but they don't see him as, as their brother. They don't see him as the same as them. So he grows up isolated, alone. In the middle of two groups of people, he's not really accepted by either. So there's one day that Moses is, is walking outside and he sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite man, a Hebrew man. So Moses runs over to help the man out. He ends up killing the Egyptian. He gets afraid, and he buries the man. And he hopes that he gets away with it, like sneaks off. He goes back out the next day, and there's two Hebrew men that are fighting against each other this time. And, and he looks at them, and he stops them. He's like, stop. Why are you fighting amongst yourselves? We have, we have a... A common enemy is the Egyptians. Why are you fighting amongst yourselves? You don't need to fight amongst yourselves. And one of the men says, what are you going to do? You're going you gonna to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And Moses is terrified all of a sudden. He realizes that his secret is known. So he flees. He realizes if, if, the, if the Israelites know, if the Hebrews know about this secret that he had, then it, you know, the Egyptians would soon find out. So he runs away. Moses could have looked at his own context as a reason to trust God or to doubt. Either way. And there's plenty to back up either side of that coin. Right? Because if you look at the trust side, I mean, look at what God brought him through. 
He should never have survived. He should have died as an infant. But instead, through a number of uh, near miraculous events, he's saved. He's protected. He grows up. He grows up in, you know, in the palace. He grows up not in poverty, but in wealth. He grows up with all of his needs met and then some. But then in a moment where, again, life happens, he should have been arrested. He probably would have been killed, but he's able to escape and he runs away to, to Midian nearby. He, he goes to this well. He meets, he meets some women at the well. He ends up meeting their dad. They're shepherds. This is a kind of a shepherding village area. And he, he's like, I guess I live here now. I guess I'm a shepherd. And he marries one of the daughters. It seems as if God has taken care of him every step along the way. It, you could look at this story as every step, God has already been there to meet him and has a plan for him and has, you know, has a future specifically for Moses. You could look at it that way, and that would create trust. You could also very easily look at Moses' story, and it could create doubt, right? Because he grew up in it in a world where he was not accepted by two sides, not just one people group, but two people groups. He lived in the middle of them, and neither of them really welcomed him into, into their own people, neither, neither into their own numbers. And not only that, but then, you know, just things in life happen, and when ha life happened, he had to leave. He had to leave the little bit of happiness and peace that he had and ran away. And now he's in a new land, in a new area, starting over again. All, right, all of those transition pieces, right? they could lead to doubt. As I say often, transition is an opportunity for growth. Every transition is an opportunity for growth. You can look at transition, you can look at these moments in life as either growth and take that step forward as an opportunity to trust, or, or you could look at it as here we go again, and it's an opportunity to doubt. So that's, that's Moses' context, right? That's, that's what led him all the way up to the point that we're going to look at the next, the next moment. And this is the moment of the burning bush, right? So his whole history has led him to this place. It's defined him. And <laughs> Moses is out, right? Like I said, he, he's like, I guess I'm a shepherd now. I guess I live here now and I do this. So he's out tending the flocks in this field. And he looks up and he's, <laughs> he sees something that he's never seen before. It was in chapter 3, verse 2 of Exodus. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush, which is quite a sentence. That's quite a sentence. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And Moses ran away as fast as he could. That's not actually in there, and that's not actually true. That's what I probably would have done. I would have been like, that's that's not okay. That's a weird thing. I'm not sure I'm sticking around to find out, right? But he does. He stays around, and he, uh, he sticks around. Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why this bush does not burn up? Again, he's like, okay, I'm going to be brave. This is a weird thing. Let's go investigate. Let's see what this burning, non-burning bush is all about. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses turned and ran away as fast as he could. Again, that's, that's not true. Again, that would be my exit point. Like, okay, now you're calling my specific name. This, this bush or this fire or something inside the bush, if I, I'm not sure how it all works, but it's yelling my name. I'm out. Like, that's not, this is not okay. This is not normal. This is not natural. Something, something's not right here, and I'm not sticking around to find out about it. But not Moses. Moses said, here I am. Okay, I guess if you know my name, I might as well tell you. Yep, I'm here. I'm right here. Just so we know, we're all clear. I'm right here. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And what's interesting is, in this moment, this is when Moses 
becomes fearful. I think, I think for me, if I was like, oh, this is God, my natural would be obviously reverence, but I don't know if fear would be the predominant idea here. Moses was literally f- afraid to look upon the bush for fear that his life would be taken from him. Which makes a lot of sense in the context of history and in this moment. I mean, even from the, the culture that he grew up in, right? The, the Egyptian culture. Pharaoh, who's looked upon as a deity in that culture, they, they're okay with Pharaoh deciding anyone's life or death any moment. If someone looked upon him with the wrong look at the wrong moment, he could take their life without repercussion, without a second thought, and would move on beyond it immediately. This is, this is the same idea, the same mindset that Moses has, right? Um, so he becomes fearful when he recognizes who is actually talking to him. But then, you know, God continues to talk to him. He's like, look, I've seen and I've heard what my people, the Israelites, are going through and have been going through, and I'm going to do something about it. In fact, you're going to do it with me. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Remember what we said? One of the reasons why, we, why it's so difficult to trust, it's who I am. That's what makes it difficult to trust. That's part of the problem here. And Moses calls us out from the get-go. Who am I? Who am I? Why would you trust me? Why would you ask me to do this, to go to Pharaoh, to go back to Egypt, to try to rescue the people that I'm a part of, but I've never actually been a part of? Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? It's like, and God's like, hey, I'm going to be with you. He's like, well, I, but what if they ask me a question? What if they ask me a question of who, who is their God? Because it's interesting at this point, like I said, the Israelites are a people group. They've been called God's nation, but God really hasn't been very present. Like he, they haven't, there's nothing, there's no action that's happened other than, other than them being in slavery the whole time. So this is a valid question. Like they don't even know who God is. They don't even know his name. So God answers, said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So God's like, now I've answered your question. I've told you I'm going to be with you. Um, If you go and when you go and do this, I'm going to lead the nation of Israel and you're going to be at the front. And I'm going to lead you to a, to a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the promised land. And, and not only that, you know, I'm going to take care of Pharaoh. You don't have to worry about Pharaoh. I'm going to take care of him. And on the exit, when, when the nation of Israel leaves Egypt, you're not going empty-handed. I'm going to fill your pockets. You're going to carry as much as you possibly can on your way out. And Moses is like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'm your guy. I'm not sure I can do this. I don't think that I have what it takes. You've got the wrong guy. You've got the wrong guy. So, you know, what if they don't believe still? Even though I tell them who you are, what if they don't believe me? What if it's a me thing? And God's like, hey, let me give you, I'll give you a couple signs that you can do. Right? So first he says to Moses, Take your staff that's in your hand, throw it on the ground. When he does so, it turns into a snake, which that for me is terrifying. I am not a big fan of snakes. Then he tells Moses, pick up the snake. And he picks up the snake and it turns back into a staff. He says, and if they still don't believe, you can do this one. He says, take your hand and put it inside your cloak. And when he does, and then he pulls his hand out of the cloak, his hand is is leprous, which leprosy was this horrible disease that it, it guaranteed that you were going to be an outsider for the rest of your life, that essentially it ate away at your, at, at your body, and it was so contagious that people just, you were isolated. That's the only way that it could keep it from 
you know, moving through the entire group of the people is you had to be isolated. You have to be away. You had to be alone. So he had, you know, he takes his hand out and it's leprous. And then God says, okay, put it back in your cloak. He puts it back in his cloak and in his hand is then immediately healed and rejuvenated. It's back to perfect condition, which these are two, I mean, terrifying signs. It's like, why would, why can't you be like, okay, throw your staff down. And then it turns into like, a car, right, that they'd never seen before. It's like, oh, my goodness, what even is this thing? And then he's like, all right, pick it up, and it turns back to his staff. Like, why couldn't he do that? seems like it's a lot more fun. I'm not sure why it had to be a snake or leprosy, but he does. Anyway, that's not my choice. But he does this, right? And Moses is still like, I just, I just don't, I'm just not really sure about all of this. I'm not really sure about all this. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. He's coming up with every single excuse that he could possibly think of. And at the very end, he's like, hey, God, I'm not sure if you've recognized this in our conversation between me and this burning bush that's not burning. Uh, I can't I can't talk very good. <laughs> I, I'm not eloquent, I, and in fact, I'm not only not eloquent, but it, I can't do it very well. Like, I, I have a speech impediment here. How is that supposed to work for me to talk on behalf of you to Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the planet? How am I supposed to do that? The Lord said to him, he gets kind of frustrated with Moses, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? It's like, Moses, I'm the one who created you. I knew, I knew about that beforehand, before I ever asked you, before I ever started burning this bush. Like, I know that about you. That's not an issue for me. It's not an issue. That is a non-issue. Moses had plenty of reasons to not trust. Right? And we all do, always, in every single relationship, in every single moment that there's a gap in the relationship between the expectation and the, you know, the, the reality of what we face. Every single time, there are plenty of reasons why it's difficult to trust. There's always an excuse of not to trust. But it's a choice to place trust in that gap. And it's a choice to place trust in a relationship with God. And, and Moses does just that. He chooses. He chooses a new direction, right? If you look at his history, it's like, I, I'm not sure if this guy is very trusting in his life because of his history. But in this moment, he chooses to trust. And by doing so, he chooses a new direction. He chooses a new default for himself to move in, to live in, to experience life in. And as Moses, he goes along with all of this, they go to Pharaoh, and if you've heard the story, uh, you know, Pharaoh, they're like, hey, Pharaoh, just let's be honest, the whole slavery thing, not really working out for us. Like, we're not really enjoying it after a few centuries of this. Um, it's, not, it's not really what we like. So if you don't mind, God's noticed also that he's, He's not really down with this either. Not you, the deity, you think that you're a deity, but our God, the real God. Like, he's not okay with this either, so we're just gonna, we're just gonna exit. If that's all right with you, uh, we're gonna do that. Pharaoh, of course, says, no, you're my workforce. I've got, <laughs> I've got some more pyramids to build. Like, I've got some stuff in, in store that I'm planning on the workforce being there and being part of. So, no, no, you can't, you can't go just because you asked. And so there's this back and forth that goes on and on and on. Uh, and, and Moses, you know, he asks, and then Pharaoh says no, and Moses turns the Nile River into blood, which is pretty gross, I think. Uh, and then they come back to Pharaoh, and they're like, okay, you saw, you saw what we did with the river, right? So now will you let us go? And Pharaoh's like, no, no, we, no, that's not the thing that's going to change my mind. Do you know who you're talking to? And Moses was like, I was afraid of that. And then there's a plague of gnats. And then they come back and they do this thing all over again. And after the gnats, there's flies. After flies, there's 
there's frogs after frogs. There's, you know, there's a disease in the livestock after the livestock. There's, uh, there's hail after hail. There's boils. I mean, there's on and on and on all of these things that happen. And eventually at the very, at the very end, at the last plague, Moses goes to Pharaoh. He's like, you really, you really should listen to me this time. And Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to. So Moses leaves, and he goes back to the Israelite nation, group of people. And he tells them, the next plague is going to be different. It's going to be more devastating than any of the other ones. Even though crops have been lost, even though there's been sickness, even though you know, all these things have already happened, this is going to be the worst one. He said, essentially, what's going to happen is there's an angel of death that's going to fly over the region. And if, if you make a sacrifice with a, a lamb and you take some of that sacrificial lamb's blood and you paint it over the door frame of your home, you will be saved. But if you don't, just like the Egyptians, when the angel of death passes over, your firstborn son will die. So the Israelites, they do it, right? They, they, take, they make a sacrifice, sacrifice a lamb, they paint the blood over their door frame, and that evening, that night, the angel of death passes over, and there's a great, a great wailing and cry from the lamb because all of the Egyptian firstborn sons died. And in this moment, Pharaoh finally relents. He's like, okay, get out of, just get away, just leave, get out of my sight, get out of my land, get out of my country, just go. So they do, and they take, they plunder the whole way out. They've got their arms full, just like God said that they would. And if you know the rest of the story, they, they're trying to leave, they get up to the Red Sea, and sure enough, Pharaoh gets angry, gets upset, he his mourning turns to anger, and he sends his army out to, to wipe them out, to go get them and bring them back at least. And Moses steps out, and the Red Sea parts. And the Israelites walk across dry land, through the sea. And then as soon as they pass through, the waters collapse back behind them, and Pharaoh's army is lost. That's the story. But that's the story. This is where they went. And from there, they eventually they go out to the desert for a while. That's a whole other thing. And then, then they're finally given their land flowing with milk and honey, their own land, the promised land, a nation of their own, right? So here's the amazing part to me. It goes all the way back to this one singular moment, this one opportunity for Moses talking to a bush, talking to a bush that was on fire that was not burning. What hung in the balance of Moses' decision to trust God? I mean, in that moment, right, Moses heard God. God was telling him, I, this is what I'm going to do. But Moses, I mean, it was like, is that really going to happen? What hung in the balance of Moses' decision was the freedom of an entire nation out of slavery. That's massive. One man's decision to trust God changes an entire nation. Now, I don't, I don't think that, may, maybe I'm naive here, but I'm pretty sure that none of us, what hangs in the balance of our trust is not an entire nation going free from slavery. I don't think any of us are up against that. But, but we do have things, right? We do have things that hang in the balance of our decision to trust God. There are things in our life that are absolutely dependent on our choice, our decision to trust God or not. It's our, our future trajectory in life, our life trajectory, right? The type of person we will become, part of this is determined by our ability to trust God, to decide that that's a priority for us, that that's a relationship that we want to have. Our family, our family tree, you know, our kids, our kids' kids, our, our grandkids' kids, our great-grandkids, all the way through, we can make a choice to trust God and in so doing that we are changing not just our life, but so many lives that are going to come after. Not only that, but the choice to, to trust God, that can affect every single circle of influence that we have. 
And there's a ripple effect because as we affect those lives and those other people, then as their life changes and transforms, then they affect their circles of influence. And it goes, you know, exponentially, people change. People are growing. People are moving in a new direction with a new default to trust. But this is, this is massive. And it comes down to a choice that you can make. You know, it's interesting. My son, um, I learn a lot from, from Luke. He's four years old. And it's interesting to see what he expects and what he trusts me with and for. For whatever reason, anytime that we go grocery shopping, he assumes, he expects, he trusts that there's a trip to McDonald's and getting French fries at the end of it. Like that's, for, for whatever reason, that is the expectation. I've never communicated that to him. I've never said, hey, if you go grocery shopping with me, we're going to get French fries. That's never been, that's never been a thing. I mean, I think we did it once, but it wasn't like this is for once and for all, every single time. This is just a one-time gig. Well, he's interpreted that as we're going to do this all the time. We do that with God. We trust God with things that he never communicated to us, don't we? And typically it's our circumstances. It's, it's our situation that we're facing. And we trust God that he's going to intervene and he's going to change the parameters, that he's going to move on our behalf and change the outcome, that he's going to protect us from, from the evil and the bad in the world, and he's going to keep us from being sick. He, he's going to keep, allow us to keep our job or get us a better job or whatever it might be. There's things that we trust God with that he may have never promised us. He may have never put his word out there and said that I will do that for you. And yet we trust God. And when that doesn't go through the way that we want it to, we start to distrust God, right? Because we put our faith in him before and then it didn't work out the way that I wanted to. It ended up in my pain. So because I trusted God and I experienced pain, then therefore the pain is because of God. No, the pain was there because life is full of pain. God never said that he would remove the pain from life if you would trust him. No, no, no. The, the things that we trust God with, it's our past. That, that we're going to trust God that he will love us, that he will embrace us, he will forgive us in spite of all of the, the mistakes we've made. We could substitute sin for mistake in there. For all of the wrongdoing that we've done, we trust him that he is big enough, that he is loving enough, that he is forgiving enough. He has enough mercy and grace to extend to us. Right? That's, that's something that we trust God for. We also trust God for our present, to, to help us navigate through what we're facing right now. Not that we're going to, you know, he's going to alleviate and remove all of the challenges and all of the negative things in life, but he's going to be there with us. In fact, we say on a regular basis that God doesn't, following Jesus doesn't make life easy. But following Jesus makes life better, and it makes us better at life. There's a world of difference between easy and better. We, we also trust God for our future. We trust God that in the future, he will be there with us and for us. That's what we trust, our past, our present, our future. That's what we're trusting God with. The things that are out of our control, we're trusting God with those things. And we're even trusting God with the things that he brings into our possession. We're going to trust him with that as well. Even if it doesn't look like we want it to, we still trust him. That's a choice that we make. Now, I don't know if, I don't know if you've had a moment where you walked away from faith. I don't know if you've had a, a reason to not trust God. And it's probably valid. Like you probably have some experience that you're like, this is why I don't. And if I had walked through that the way that you have, I might be in your same shoes. But when you evaluate, if you're able to step back from the situation, are you not trusting God because life was difficult or because he failed you? Because those are different. Those are very different. Are you not trusting God because of pain or because he didn't come through on what he said he would do? Those are different. We can trust God, as difficult as that might seem. We can 
trust him. My encouragement is that you would, you would give it a chance, that you would just give God a chance. You would take a step in his direction. We, we say this every once in a while, that your direction, not your intention, determines your destination. That your direction, your, we can even put default, right? We talked about that today, that your direction is actually the default that you, you revert back to in life when you've made this the pattern of behavior, the pattern of life, to place trust in the middle of, it, of the relationship. That your direction, your new default, not your intention, determines your destination, you can intend all you want to end up somewhere in life, but until you put into action and into steps to do it, you won't get any closer. Now, looking at, at Moses' story, something else that makes it difficult, right? We talked about this. Who I am makes it difficult to trust. We don't trust God because, because we are enough. We're good enough. We've done enough. We don't trust God because we're perfect. We don't make mistakes. But that's, that's an us thing. We trust God because he is enough. We trust God because it's about the direction that he wants to move us in. That we trust God for our growth. We trust God for a new direction, for a new default. I'm going to encourage you this morning, wherever you're at, to figure out what, what is holding you back from trusting God and what's holding you back from the next step that you know you need to take. Let me pray. We'll close out today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for our yesterday. We thank you for our tomorrow. God, we know that we often are the ones that are in the way of trusting you. And in those moments where, where we feel like there's a gap in the relationship, I pray that we would choose to place trust in it. I pray that we would choose to trust you and I also pray that we would get into the habit, the, the new default in our life would be to place trust into relationships. That we would choose to believe the best about somebody rather than assume the worst. And then in so doing, in so doing, we would, we would lean in and we would have and gain access and they would gain access to our potential, our ability, to our skill set, to our strengths, to our, our opportunities that we have that we could give them or loan to them. God, I pray that you would help us to become more like you. Less like me, less like us, more like you. God, we thank you for everything that you do for us. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thanks for joining with us today. I hope that it was helpful and